Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings you have bestowed upon us this day. That we may discern more clearly the events that you have told that shall come to pass and that have come to pass, that we may know that you are God and there is no other. Anoint our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say unto us as your church this day. And give us hearts willing to surrender all that we may humbly walk with you. And that we may humbly share these messages to a world that knows you not. In a time that is soon to close. Anoint your messenger once again of a double portion of your spirit. That you would be honored and you would be glorified. In Jesus' precious name we thank you. Amen. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue on in uh, this presentation that was, is titled The First and the Last, but we pretty much got through that piece of the presentation. We're going to start going into another um, piece of the presentation. This is uh, just some building blocks before we um, launch into some systematic study of end time events. Uh, we should get concluded with the building blocks in this presentation and following this then we're going to go into the study we call the purification of God's church which is where we try to set forth the outline for end time events both before the Sunday law at the Sunday law and after the Sunday law but where we began where we ended last time was um, with the quote from selected messages where sister white talks about the Prophets spoke more for our day than the days in which they set forth their prophecies. So we want to continue on a little bit with this theme. Um, in Acts of the Apostles 585, which I believe that we read from last night, um, it said, in the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet an end, which uh, I've made a point on that a couple of times so far. From my mind, in my mind, this is important to recognize that the point of reference for end of the world material is the book of Revelation. That's, that's the, the foundation of, of aligning end time events is the book of Revelation. This is where all the um, books come to their conclusion. And in the Revelation, we're going to deal with at least one of the, the symbolized uh, characteristics of end time events is found in the revelation in this presentation and you can see it on the whiteboard there the beast dragon and false prophet the three powers that lead the world of Armageddon and in, in a quote on the screen from manuscript releases volume 17 page 18 it says John beholds the things which will be in the last day days and sees a people working counter to God and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophets, prophet. For they are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they shall see his shame. Revelation 16, verses 13 through 15. The the subject of the beast, dragon, and false prophet is a subject that Seventh-day Adventists uh, need to understand at the end of the world because Revelation 16 teaches us that modern Babylon is made up of three parts. These are the three parts, the beast, dragon, and false prophet. Uh, modern in Bible prophecy, representing end of the world. Ancient in Bible prophecy, beginning of the world. Uh, modern Babylon in Revelation 16 is the Babylon that exists up to the second coming of Christ. And what the Bible teaches is that modern Babylon is composed of three parts, unlike ancient Babylon. Ancient Babylon began on the plains of Shinar, and it was one power. And the, the story of Bible prophecy, uh, at least one way to track the story of Bible prophecy, is the story of Babylon, how it began as one power um, in the days of Nimrod, and continued on through history as one power, opposing God, opposing his people, persecuting his people. And then there came a time in history where a second power that was to oppose God and his people comes into history, that being the papal power. Um, began to rule supremely in 538, but we know that the mystery of iniquity was already active in the 
the early church. So the, the story of how the papacy comes um, to take its seat on the throne of the earth uh, begins a few hundred years before 538. But what I'm wanting us to see here is that Bible prophecy, the, the power that was struggling against ancient Israel in the Old Testament was paganism. And Bible prophecy, um, after it deals with paganism, it, be, it introduces a new power that comes into history that's also going to oppose God and its people, and this is papalism. And papalism, we know, would rule the world supremely for 1260 years. And at the time period that papalism is receiving its deadly wound, a third power is coming into history that's destined to oppose God and its people. And the point is this, I hope we all recognize this. Bible prophecy, the, the story the, that is used by the prophets to portray Bible prophecy is the story of Babylon. It's the story, from one point of view, it's the story of first the Babylon of, in the plains of Shinar and then the transition to papal Rome and after that story is portrayed then the transition to the next power, the United States of America, the false prophet. That's where Bible prophecy is portrayed. Therefore, we need to be familiar with what Babylon is all about. That's one reason that we should be familiar. Another reason that we should be familiar is the, the summary of the message that we are to give to the world if we prove faithful is come out of Babylon. The fourth angel's message. So if we are going to be the people that uh, give this final warning message, come out of Babylon, then, then logic tells us that we should be the people that are the expert on what modern Babylon is. We should, we should know more about modern Babylon um, than anyone else. We're the ones that are going to call people out of there. And uh, that being said, I believe that modern Babylon is symbolized throughout um, Scripture. And in an earlier presentation, I made a statement, uh, you, I know you heard it, it may not have meant, you may not, not have thought too much about it, maybe it isn't as significant in your mind as it, as it is in mine, but I truly believe, I'm under conviction, uh, and this is something for me, I've just came under conviction here in the recent past, but I truly believe that uh, when the, the Millerite time period is repeated at the end of the world, that uh, one of the things that has been identified that took place in the Millerite time period is that William Miller, who you can't separate from the Millerite history, that's where we, we get the name Millerite, is from him. One of the things that the Lord led him to do was to put together a list of rules that he used to come to the present truth message of the hour. And uh, if you're not familiar with those, you can, the computer in the overflow room has the Pioneer CD-ROM. You can go scan down on that and you can, you can see the rules of William Miller that he used to come to the conclusions about prophecy that he did. And I believe that God's people at the end of time will duplicate that experience. They're going to be confronted with certain rules of Bible prophecy that are the rules that we need to use at the end of time to put together the prophetic message for this day and age. And it, it, it will not be the day-year principle. We don't need that any longer because time shall be no longer. There's going to be prophetic rules, though, that are important for God's people to recognize in order to come to grips with the final warning message. And I'm saying that based upon the fact that the Millerite movement is fulfilled again to the very letter. And so I would suggest to you that one of those rules, one of those things that we need to recognize as students of prophecy at the end of the world that I think, that I believe, I'm under conviction, is one of those keys for end time Bible prophecy is modern Babylon. There, modern Babylon is portrayed throughout the scriptures and when you, by faith and study and prayer, recognize and receive the light about modern Babylon throughout the scriptures and you see it portrayed throughout the scriptures and you bring it down to the book of Revelation. What do I mean by bring it down to the book of Revelation? Uh, but when you bring it down to the book of Revelation, your, your understanding of Babylon just expands and expands. Now what do I mean about bring it down to the book of Revelation? The, the illustration that I like to use um, and I know everyone in here has probably heard this illustration, but I'll, I, for the record, I have to say it again. Uh, when, when most of us were in school, here in the United States this is the case, and I, I have a hunch in Europe, and probably even in Malaysia. When we were young children in school, where I went to school, um, 
they always had a chart on the wall, one of these roll down charts. And you would pull down page one of that chart and there was a skeleton. And then you had a second page that you could pull down and it was a transparency. And it wasn't the skeleton of the body, it was the internal organs of the body. So when you pulled it down, suddenly you had the skeleton and the internal organs. And then you pulled down the third page, which was a transparency, and you had the circulatory system, and the body just grew and grew and grew. And I believe the chart, when it was finally at the end, and you had the hair and the skin and everything on, I think it even had a, a pull down where you dressed the body. And that's what Bible prophecy is. It's uh, taking a line of history, a line of prophetic history, and bringing it down to the end of the world and placing it there. And then bringing another line of prophetic, prophetic history, line upon line, and overlaying it correctly. There's the key. That's the trick. Making sure that you're placing it the same sequence upon the same sequence so they're aligned. But as we bring these different lines of prophecy and build them one upon another, the information about that particular line of prophecy uh, doesn't just double or, or each time it, it more than doubles that's the way um, God works and uh, very in you, when you begin to do that we also find that God is not redundant if he if he's telling us something about the end of the world and he symbolized it um, five places in the scripture we'll find that those five places are giving new insight not just not repeating that that piece of information you bring it together and there's a new piece of truth for instance in this quote sister white is identifying that in the book of revelation uh, the three spirits the beast the dragon and the false prophet have been portrayed um, in uh, let's look at uh, let me see if i have this on I don't have to look in the Bible, it's here. Um, so I'll just go on to the next screen. Re I'm reminding us here in this first quote, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Now, I, as we go through this uh, prophecy school, you're going to see me referring from time to time to, the, to this principle upon the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established. And I think we read four or five of them previously where we were dealing with simply this rule. Well, this is another verse in the Bible that's teaching the same thing. As I refer to it, it's going to be a different verse. I want you to understand that this rule of upon t testimony of two or three a thing is established pervades the Bible. So rem let's remind us of that as we begin to look at the beast, the dragon, and false prophet. We see Revelation 16, verse 13. And uh, on the screen you see the beast is Catholicism, the false prophet is apostate Protestantism, and the dragon is spiritualism. Now, what we, can, what we can remind ourselves about that little breakdown at the bottom is this. All the prophets were speaking about the end of the world, but they used their uh, words, their intelligence to portray the information that they saw. And this example here on the bottom of your screen, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, John the Revelator, when he seen these three powers, the words that he chose to use to represent these power was beast, dragon, and false prophet. Ellen White, who is just as inspired as John the Revelator, when she deals with these same three powers, she calls them Catholicism, apostate Protestantism, and spiritualism. That's the ones we're usually familiar with in Adventism. So the, it's worthwhile to understand that, but what I'm hoping we see is beyond understanding that the beast is Catholicism, false prophet, apostate Protestantism, dragon is spiritualism. What we also see here is two prophets identifying the same thing at the end of the world, but they're using two different sets of symbol, symbols to identify the same thing. That's where the work of a student of prophecy comes in. We have to come to understand what John meant by his words, what Ellen White meant by her words, what Peter meant by his words, and correctly bring them together. In verse 19 of Revelation 16, uh, it says, And the great city was divided into three parts, and uh, 
In the book of Revelation alone, you'll see the references. If you haven't looked this up before, there are more even in the book of Revelation, but there are places throughout the Bible beyond Revelation that a city symbolizes a kingdom in Bible prophecy. So what verse 6, 19 is saying, and uh, those references, by the way, will be far beyond two or three witnesses. A thing is established. Um, a city in Bible prophecy, a geopolitical kingdom. It's saying the... The, the kingdom, the political, geopolitical kingdom of modern Babylon at the end of the world is divided into three parts. And these three parts are the beast, dragon, and false prophet. So I want to look at some places in scripture that are portraying the end of the world and see that the enemy of God, um, however we want to portray it, in, in those scenes of the end of the world, the enemy is divided into three parts. And of course, one place where we can see the end of the world portrayed is um, in the time period of Christ. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 406, says the trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate the position of the people of God in their experience before the second coming of Christ. How the enemy sought every occasion to take control of the minds of the Jews and today is seeking to blind the minds of God's servants that they may not be able to discern the precious truth. Now, Sister White, I, I admit in this passage, she's talking about um, the darkness that ancient Israel was in during the, the time period of Christ and how difficult it was for the truth to break through that darkness. And she's pointing it down to our day and age and she's saying, yeah, God's people at the end of the world, they're in the Laodicean condition. And it's just as difficult, it's even more difficult now, according to inspiration, to break through the darkness in our minds as Seventh-day Adventists than it was for ancient Israel. But nevertheless, even though that's what this paragraph is speaking about, she's also saying that prophetically, again and again, she's been, she was inspired to say to us that the history of the time period of Christ is a history that parallels the end of the world. And... At the end of the world, all of us will admit that God's enemy at the end of the world is threefold. We know that. That's, that's standard teaching, the beast, dragon, and false prophet. So what I'm suggesting is that the history during the time period of Christ has been pointed out in inspiration again and again as illustrating our history, then we, it wouldn't be shocking for us to find that the enemy of God's people during the time period of Christ was represented in a threefold fashion. And... Uh, I would suggest to you that it is illustrated above the cross. Now, um, let's read this, John 19, 18 through 20, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, and Jesus in the midst, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh unto the city, and it was written in Hebrew, and Greek and Latin. And I'm suggesting to you that the, the three enemies in the history of Christ is symbolized in the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Latin. And here's the thing. Here, this is one of the stumbling blocks I think some of us may have to, to considering modern, modern Babylon in this fashion. One of the stumbling blocks is, is that we've come to understand that the beast, the dragon, and false prophet is the power that leads the world to Armageddon. So it, we not only, if we're going to see this power symbolized in God's word somewhere else, we're expecting to see it portraying the world being led to Armageddon. And I'm suggesting to you that uh, that isn't the case. When we see this threefold enemy um, illustrating modern Babylon in the other passages of Scripture, it's giving us a different characteristic, a different attribute of modern Babylon. And when we bring that down and lay it over, Revelation 16, then the story of Babylon begins to expand. And what I'm suggesting to you is that the three enemies symbolized in the Hebrew, Greek, and Latin above the cross, they're not telling how modern Babylon leads the world to Armageddon. They're telling the story of how Every man was an enemy against God and alienated from Christ. And it was at the cross that Christ reconciled those enemies unto himself. And that in a general sense, in, in the broadest sense, which the story of Christ is usually the broadest sense of Bible prophecy, 
the enemies of Christ were broken down into a threefold fashion. Now, it's not simply this. As we go through this study, if you haven't ever looked at this, and I think there's some in here that may not have ever looked at this, um, we're going to identify characteristics of these threefold enemies that allows you to have confidence that you're on the right track. And one of the characteristics of this threefold enemy when you find them in Bible prophecy is that many times two of the three will be in a singular fashion and the other will be in a plural fashion. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. There are certain, certain nationalities in the Bible that are understood as pluralities of people. Um, the Phil, the um, Philistines are one of those tribes in the Bible that are, are a, a made up of a multitude of people. They're the sea people. Um, the descendants of Ishmael are a confederacy of people. But another nation in the Bible that we're specifically told is a plurality of people is the Greeks. And uh, I'm, I'm one slide behind, but let's go over this. We'll get to Greek in a minute. Um, here's the quote of uh, the enemies of God, Romans 5.10. If when, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Uh, the relic, they, these are all relatives of Adam. These are all descendants of Adam. You'll see what we mean by relatives as we move forward. These threefold enemies are generally relatives of Israel. But the cross is telling the, the broad general story. These are descendants of Adam. Hebrew meaning from the other side. Descendant of Shem. Greek, plural. Greek means sons of the Ionians. Descendant of Japheth. The one that was going to go out and multiply numerically in the world. And then Latin, spiritually, a descendant of Ham. But two singular, one plural. The Latin and the Hebrew are singular nations, um, biblically. Greeks are plural. And in Desire of Ages 621, and there, there are other places, but this is one. We're told, these men came from the West to find the Savior at the close of his life, as the wise men had come from the East at the beginning, at the time of Christ's birth the Jewish people were so engrossed with their own ambitious plans that they knew not of his advent. The Magi from the heathen land came to the manger with their gifts to worship the Savior. So these Greeks, representing the nations, tribes, and peoples of the world, came to see Jesus. So the people of all lands and all ages would be drawn to the Savior's cross. So shall many come from east and west and shall set down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 8:11. <clears throat> in Numbers 22, what I was suggesting about the cross, let me summarize it before I move into Numbers 22. Here's what I'm suggesting. Is that in Revelation 16, we're taught that modern Babylon is made up of three entities. The beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And in Revelation 16, it's telling how these three entities, what the role is for these three enemies to lead the world to Armageddon. The final a warfare on planet Earth just before the return of Christ. I'm suggesting that as different histories in the Bible are portraying the end of the world, that many times they also, those histories, will possess an illustration of the enemies of God, and we will find them in a threefold fashion, and many times we will find that two of those threefold enemies are in a singular fashion, one in a plural, and that most times they are relative to ancient Israel. So here at the cross it was relative to mankind, relatives of mankind in general. And uh, that when we bring these different testimonies together, and how many testimonies of the threefold enemy have we already considered in this presentation? See, even though we didn't spend much time, we've really looked at three testimonies. Revelation 16 tells about how modern Babylon leads the world to Armageddon, but we did refer to Sister White. She called the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet 
Catholicism, apostate Protestantism, and spiritualism. She wasn't speaking about how that threefold power leads the world to Armageddon. She was telling us this is the religious manifestation of modern Babylon at the end of the world. She was giving us another piece of the puzzle. And then we looked at another piece of the puzzle at the cross. And what it was teaching us about modern Babylon is this is where mankind is that comes to the foot of the cross. It's also where mankind is that rejects the story of the cross. But it's teaching the lesson that the focus of the gospel call is to Babylon. These are all stories about Babylon, but none of those three stories, only one of those sto three stories is talking about how the world gets to Armageddon. See, Jesus is taking, through his prophetic word, he's taking different lines of history that include information about Babylon, and we're to bring them down to the end of the world, and as we do, our understanding of modern Babylon grows, it broadens, it deepens. So in Numbers 22, we have a story that you usually don't get much argument about that it illustrates the end of the world. This is the children of Israel just before they're going into the promised land. Adventist Home 327 says, Near the close of this earth's history, Satan will work with all his power in the same manner and with the same temptations wherewith he tempted ancient Israel just before they're entering the land of promise. He will lay snares for those who claim to keep the commandments of God and who are almost on the borders of heavenly Canaan. Now, Sister White is, is taking the history of Numbers 22, and she's saying this is a history that illustrates the end of the world. This is a history about ancient Israel that's illustrating the future um, situation of modern Israel. And uh, in, in our home, just a few nights ago, there was a few of us, or a couple of us, having a conversation, and, and, and not, in a, not in a gossipy way, in a, in a serious way, and uh, off the top of our head, we were, we were reminding ourselves of how many public figures in Adventism in the recent past have uh, lost their way because of immorality. And how was it in Numbers 22 that the children of Israel I got swept away by Balak, Balaam, and uh, Moab, or, or Midian, I think it was. It was from the, the, the heathen women. But in any case, and Sister White confirms that, in Numbers 22, that, that would be something where Adventism is in fact, Sister White confirms that. Um, let me check my notes. Here is... Uh, Numbers 22, 4 through 6, where we find that in the story of Numbers 22, just before the children of Israel went into the promised land, that the enemy that was resisting their entrance into the promised land is threefold in nature. Verse 4 says, And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, so here we have Moab and Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field, and Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam. Here's the third enemy. The son of Beor to Pithor, which is by the river in the land of the children of his people. And, and, and notice that as you go through the story of Balaam over and over again, they don't just simply say Ch Balaam. They associate him with the children of, the, of his people. What for? Why is that important to the story? What kind of information does that give us? But nevertheless, as you go through the Bible that deals with Balaam or spirit of prophecy, for some reason, inspiration associates him with the children of his people. And I suggest to you that many times this word children is the, the symbol of a plural power. It's a way of, of saying here's the plural power of the three, whereas Moab and Midian are singular. But back to the verse, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I what that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. I'm suggesting to you that here's ancient Israel just about ready to go in the promised land and they're definitely prefiguring modern Israel just before they're to go in the promised land and that they were confronted with a threefold enemy, Moab, Midian, and Balaam that associated with the children of his people. 
Moab uh, is a descendant of Lot. Uh, Midian is a descendant of Abraham. Um, all of these three powers have blood connections to Israel. They're relatives of ancient Israel. And two of them are in a singular um, fashion, one in a plural. And what was their, what was their purpose? They went to curse Israel. Now, brothers and sisters, in this story, I'm suggesting to you that Moab, Midian, and Balaam, they symbolize modern Babylon at the end of the world. That's who they're representing in the, the history that is prefiguring the end of the world. But they're not telling the story of how the world has led to Armageddon. This isn't the story of how the world has led to Armageddon. It's a story about modern Babylon, but it's a different story. What's this story about modern Babylon? This is a story about how modern Babylon impacts modern Israel. And how does modern Babylon impact modern Israel? And the book of Revelation takes it up as well. The, uh, it, the doctrine of Balaam. What's the doctrine of Balaam? What did Balaam teach God's people to do? To commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, there is a rule in Bible prophecy that we're heading towards, and I, I'm sure that most of you are familiar here with it, but I'll, let me just jump forward to it briefly. I won't, I won't define it at this point, but it's that... Prophecy before the cross is understood in its literal application. Prophecy after the time period of the cross is understood in its spiritual application. Okay, that being said, we have more to deal with that, that rule. But Numbers 22 is talking about literal Israel and it's telling what literally went on. But what literally went on is prefiguring what spiritually goes on at the end of time. And Numbers 22, when it's dealing with Midian, Moab, and, the, and Balaam, it's not talking about going to Armageddon. It's talking about how modern Babylon impacts modern Israel. And so what does it mean to eat things sacrificed to idol and commit fornication spiritually? We're looking for a spiritual application of this literal history. What does it mean to do that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Remember uh, John the Revelator in Revelation 10? What did he do? He took the book of Daniel, and he ate it. And it was sweet in his mouth, but bitter in his stomach. Um, these people are eating something here, but it isn't the word of God. It's things sacrificed to idols, idolatry. Um, they're consuming false doctrine. They're committing fornication. What is fornication? It's spiritually an unlawful relationship. Um, it, there's some kind of Unholy relationship here being pointed forward to. It's, it's teaching that at the end of time, modern Babylon, some way, somehow, modern Babylon is going to oppose, undermine, attack modern Israel by fostering unholy relationships between modern Babylon and modern Israel and by promoting, establishing false doctrine, the doctrines of Rome within modern Israel. You've got to be careful on what you're saying here because this, this makes people think that uh, what you're up doing in this type of service is trying to say that uh, you know, we need to separate from God's church or God's church is Babylon. That isn't what this is saying at all. It's saying that God's church at the end of time is going to have an attack placed on it that comes from its enemies, and its enemy is modern Babylon. And it's saying, if you want to know what the attacks are, just read the history. From the beginning, the end is portrayed. And it doesn't say anything about separating from modern Israel at all. In fact, we've already read passages that say, the Lord will finish His work in righteousness, and He's going to use modern Israel to do it. In fact, we went, read one verse from Isaiah where He said, Israel... My glory. Did you hear that this morning when we read that? What did that mean that he was calling modern Israel his glory? Don't we think his glory is his character? Aren't we kind of putting, wasn't Isaiah putting Israel in an improper light when he said, Israel, my glory? Nope. He was just nailing it down that modern Israel, at some point in time, at some way, modern Israel is going to reflect the character of Christ and give the for, final warning message to the world as it does so. So we're not saying, we're not attacking the church here. We're just 
studying Bible prophecy. Now, in Nehemiah, story of the rebuilding and restoring of Jerusalem, this is an illustration of the end of the world. There's three places where Sister White says something such as this, that the, this is one, but there's others. This, not the repetition, there's three different places. That I found there may be more. This is Christian service, 173, 174. The experience of Nehemiah is repeated in the history of God's people at this time. What's the, what's the history of Nehemiah? It's the history of rebuilding, restoring Jerusalem after they came out of Babylon. So inspiration is saying, here is a history that is illustrating our history, modern Israel's history. Now, do we remember that history? Because in that history, there were three enemies. There wasn't four. There wasn't two. There was three. And that history was identifying modern Israel at the end of the world. And all the books of the Bible come to an end where? In Revelation. And what does Revelation say the enemy of God's people is at the end of the world? It's divided into three parts. So I, we're, we're not on shaky ground here, brothers and sisters. This is solid ground. And upon the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established. And this is a prophetic truth that is greatly resisted among God's people today. But it's easy to see if you're willing to see. So in the story of Nehemiah, which we just read, illustrates our history. Nehemiah 2.19, But when Sambalat the Horonite, and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian. Now, brothers and sisters, in Bible prophecy, Arabians are a plurality of nations. It's one of these nations that's a plural nation. Once again, singular, singular, plural. Once again, all of these are relatives of Israel. And dropping down, it says, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies. These are the enemies of God's people in this story. Threefold in nature, two singular, one plural, all relatives of Israel. Um, they thought to do him mischief. The, you notice the names, uh, the, the meaning of the names of Sanballat, the moon god, or sin is given life, idolatry. A descendant of Moab or Lot. Tobiah is Yahweh is good, descendant of Ammon or Lot. Geshem, the Arabian, born in the rainy season. When's the rainy season? When's the rainy season? Prophetically. The latter rain, yes. He's born at the, he's the enemy that's raised up during the latter rain time period. And he's a descendant of Ishmael or Abraham. Now, um, here's the rule that we were... I'm touching on. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 47. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is of the Lord from heaven. Uh, the, one of the rules that we're pointing to here is that first comes the literal and afterwards the spiritual. Um, Paul, the writings of Paul are where you can most clearly identify this rule. Galatians 3.29 And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Before the time period of the cross, if you were Abraham's seed, who were you? You were a literal blood descendant of Abraham. But Paul is teaching here that after the cross, if you're a descendant of Abraham, are you a literal blood descendant? No. Oh, you're a descendant by faith. By faith. It's, there's a transition of Bible prophecy that takes place in the time period of the cross. Sometimes I say the time of the cross. I don't mean to do it. It's a slip of the tongue. So I'm going to emphasize here, I'm saying the time period of the cross on purpose, because there are some of these prophecies, these literal prophecies from the Old Testament time period that are coming to their conclusion in the time period of the cross that actually come to their conclusion after the cross. And some people want to stumble over that. They, they want to fight this rule because of that. They see, oh, he said at the time period of the cross, everything's spiritual. And the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 certainly wasn't spiritual. It literally happened. So they, they throw it all out. So I try to say, for, to try to remove stumbling blocks, the time period of the cross is where this transition takes place.
And if you're not familiar with this rule of Bible prophecy, it's the only rule of Bible prophecy I know of that the Catholic Church purposely tried to undermine. And you can get book after book that deals with the history of this rule of Bible prophecy. Brothers and sisters, every Protestant reformer at some point in their um, coming out of Rome or coming to understand Rome, at some point in each of the reformers' experience, they came to identify the Pope of Rome as the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. Every one of them. And it's, it's documented. And the way that they did it is that is by using this rule. This rule is the rule that allows you to clearly and soundly demonstrate that the Antichrist of Bible prophecy is the Pope of Rome. And because of that, during the Counter-Reformation time period, uh, the papacy purposely invented, sent scholars away to invent rules of Bible prophecy that would destroy this rule that we're talking about. They didn't want anyone to have the ability to identify who the Antichrist was. And they came up with three, and they're still in the world today, and some of them are even impacting the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. But... But before the beginning of the 20th century, if you have access to the old Protestant libraries, we have a brother in this room, he's got some old Protestant books that you just covet to have that kind of library. Uh, but I don't know where I would put all those books. There are so many. But if you have access to those books uh, before the 20th century, you'll see the Protestants knew full well uh, this rule, they knew full well the history of Rome inventing the, the counterfeit uh, rules to destroy this, and they wrote books about it. And Protestant had nothing to do with the false rules that Catholicism invented until, until when? Ah, it was like a Trojan horse. There was a man that published a Bible, and he decided in, he was going to put Bible notes in his Bible, and he used those rules of prophetic interpretation and he put them in this new Bible and the Protestants began to take this new Bible and by beholding you become changed. And that Bible was called the Schofield Bible. They came out in the early part of the 20th century and from that point on those rules of Bible prophecy began to be received in the Protestant world and they're even in Adventism today. But nevertheless there was a time when Protestant knew, Protestantism knew this history and they knew this rule and it's one of the most, if not the most important rule in setting forth prophecy in its right light. Galatians 4, 22 through 26, 28 and 29 says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which generous to bondage, which is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Let me ask you a question. Before Paul wrote this, say 50 years before Paul wrote this, before Jesus was born, let's go back into that history. Before Jesus was born, was Jerusalem Jerusalem above? No, it was literal Jerusalem. But during the time period of the cross, then inspiration tells us Jerusalem now is Jerusalem above. There's a change that comes in Bible prophecy during the time period of the cross. Uh, but Jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all now we brethren as Isaac was are the children of the promise but Isaac was literally a blood descendant we're descendants but by faith not by blood but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit even so it is now Romans 2, 28 and 29, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Before the cross, literal. After the time period of the cross, spiritual. And if you had time to look at it, you would realize also that at the second coming of Christ, what happens? At the second coming of Christ, it goes back to literal. 
Um, but we generally don't spend much time there because we're dealing with the time period before the second coming of Christ. So, um, in Balaam, uh, in story of Nehemiah and Balaam, we have two illustrations of modern Babylon. We have in, in Balaam, Midian, and Moab, in the children of Israel entering in the promised land, and then in the story of Nehemiah, the rebuilding and restoration of Jerusalem, we have Sambalat, Toabiah, and Geshem. These two stories, neither are telling how modern Babylon leads the world to Armageddon. But they are very, they're tied together in terms of uh, the story that they are telling. They're both telling the story of how modern Babylon attacks modern Israel at the end of the world. And in Revelation 2, 12 through 14, we've already referred to this. Uh, the doctrine of Balaam is to eat things sacrificed unto idols and commit fornication. Um, and here in the next quote, Revelation 10, 9 and 10, we see an illustration of what it means to eat. Um, and we have from Acts 7, 41 to 43, um, the idolatry, the false worship of idolatry um, set forth for us. Now, in Numbers and Nehemiah, in Numbers 13, 1 and 2, there, these verses to me are key for this reason. When, when the story of Nehemiah's time period, the story of the rebuilding and rest restoration of Jerusalem, when it's being established as a history for us that live at the end of the world, a history for us to understand the end of the world, that history of Nehemiah has three enemies in it. Two singular, Tobiah, Sambalat, one plural, the Arabian, Geshem, relatives, modern Israel. This is modern Israel. That history is teaching us something about the end of the world, not how do you lead, it, lead the world to Armageddon. But I would suggest it's teaching the same, similar story as number 22. It's teaching about how Balaam uh, was used to inhibit and prevent the entrance of ancient Israel into modern Israel the promised land. And you'll notice when Nehemiah is about to describe the, the reformation that took place during this time period, notice these two verses. Notice where he goes back to. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. When Nehemiah is going to describe the reformation that took place against Tobiah, Sambalat, and Geshem, the first thing he does in these verses is he says, you need to remember Numbers 22. In other words, he's saying the history of Numbers 22 prefigured the history of Nehemiah. He ties them together. And sure enough, the story of Nehemiah and the story of Numbers are stories of modern Babylon, but they're stories about how modern Babylon attacks modern Israel at the end of time. And if you read down in Nehemiah, it tells the reformations that uh, Nehemiah had to make. In Nehemiah 13, after those two verses we just read, verse 3, it says, Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Is there a mixed multitude in modern Israel today? And before this, Eliashib, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of God, was allied to Tobiah. And I came to Jerusalem and understood all the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. What's that saying? What's that saying? That's saying that back in the story of Nehemiah, one of the enemies was living in the very heart of the sanctuary. What's that tell us about the end of the world? And it grieved me sore, therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber, then I commanded, and they cleansed the chamber. Brothers and sisters, when's the cleansing take place? Well, it took place at the second angel's message, and it's going to take place again at the fourth angel's message, paralleling the two times that Christ cleansed the temple. There's a cleansing coming, and we don't cleanse God's church by separating from it. God's going to cleanse it, cleanse it in his own way and in his own time. Amen. Our responsibility 
is to stay there and attempt to promote the final warning message inside and outside of God's church. And thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and frankincense. It was right at the heart of the work in the story of Nehemiah. And here's the next thing he deals with in this chapter. I, in those days, I saw in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath. Now that was literally going on. But at the end of the world, we're dealing with a spiritual application. Desecrating the Sabbath literally, what does that mean? spiritually at the end of the world. Because that's what we need to be looking for. In this literal history, we need to be looking for a spiritual application. Exodus 31, 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. What's it a sign of? that the Lord thy God does sanctify us. Brothers and sisters, just let me ask you a question. Your understanding of sanctification, do you, have you ever heard a false definition of what sanctification is within God's church today? Further on in the chapter, in those days also I saw Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and Ammon and of Moab and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language but according to the language of each people. What does it mean to be married spiritually to pagan wives? What's a woman spiritually in Bible prophecy? A church. What's it mean to be married to a church? You're, we're in some kind of relationship. This is, this is the fornication of the story in Numbers, right? An unlawful relationship with someone that we're not to be in relationship with. So, what am I saying? Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying this. First off, we're going to deal with these three enemies several more times in this prophecy school. We're bringing it to a conclusion here. What we're doing here is suggesting to you that one of the symbols of Bible prophecy, one of the the principles of Bible prophecy that we need to know as we go through the rest of this school is that modern Babylon at the end of the world is divided into three parts and that it's illustrated several places in Scripture. But the point of reference for them all is Revelation 16. And as it says on the screen, Revelation 16 is telling us how modern Babylon leads the world to Armageddon. But in John 19, when modern Babylon is symbolized in the Hebrew, Greek, and Latin above the cross, it's telling us mankind's relation to the cross, to Christ. How all of men are alienated and strangers from Christ. And how he's calling them back at the cross. It's another aspect of Babylon. Has nothing, well, I'm not saying it has nothing. But it, there's, you really got to make a stretch to, to say that the cross is talking about leading the world to Armageddon. You understand my point. It's a different piece of the puzzle. The, Revelation 16 is the skeleton this is the organs. And what's number tw Numbers 22? Is it telling us how the world goes to Armageddon? No, it's telling us modern Babylon's attack on modern Israel. It's a, this is the circulatory system. And I would suggest that Nehemiah 2 is a second testimony about this truth. It's, it's added light on modern Babylon's attack on modern Israel at the end of time. But this isn't the only place that modern Babylon is illustrated in Bible prophecy. And the other places it's illustrated, there are other pieces of information about the role and the purpose of modern Babylon in Bible prophecy. Will you kneel with me as far as possible? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've spent in setting up this foundation for our prophecy school. We ask that you'd help us to uh, test these things that we've heard, compare them with your word, and see if they are valid. And if they are, we ask that you would make us good students and good workmen, that we will understand how to apply these principles in a profitable way, that we can, we can come to recognize the message that you have for us individually and corporately in your prophetic word.
We ask for your continued blessings as we carry on this week, and we thank you for all that you've done for us um, so far. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.